Hey, what's going on YouTube? This is CJ. I'm gonna give you guys a quick roof update. We're gonna start off like usual, behind the tank. It's where all the filtrations housed. Give you guys a quick look at the skimmer. I'm still using my Tunzi 9004 skimmer. Mainly a semi wet to really wet skim is what I get from this. There's no real way to adjust this to get a dry skim, but hey, it works for me as long as it keeps skimming. Hasn't broken down or had any major problems over a year and a half at this point. You know, no real complaints. Now, while we're back here, like usual, I'm always gonna make sure I get you guys an update on the algae scrubber, just in case anyone's curious and to track my own progress as well. You know, document's sake, right? And I'll tell you guys for sure, it's definitely uh, starting to really grow in and thicken up inside this box if I can get it open. But overall, you know, I'm really satisfied with how it's starting to grow, especially since I've stopped with the water changes. And I say stopped, not completely, but you know, I've slowed down to one water change a week definitely uh, notice a huge improvement in my algae's growth so you know at this point i say it's fair to say it's time to clean this thing out but i want to make sure i keep you guys updated you know and keep you in the loop as far as the algae scrubbers progress so since we're back here let me give you guys a full update on everything that's going on with the tank especially you know a lot of people are new to my channel you never seen this before in a prior video i know i've covered this but hey let's touch on it again now if you guys can't tell already this is where all the magic happens. You know, I'll have two, almost almost two power strips full of equipment running on my roof tank. Everything on the strip on the left is basically my algae scrubber uh, and the pump that controls it. But before that, I literally could run my whole tank on this one power strip to the right. And while we're looking at power strips, highly recommend, can't say it enough. If you're shopping and you're new in a hobby, get you a power strip with switches on it. Definitely makes my life easier. And I'll tell you, after you get down here, and fumble around and try to unplug something, you'll realize the value of having a switch. For example, idle top off. You can tell, just clicked it on. I had to turn this off just to share my algae scrubber with you guys. You know, the slightest change in the, in the water in the rear compartment of that sump will make it kick on and I don't need that kicking on. Now, when it comes to the reservoir for my tank, I've been using this five gallon jug from Walmart for the last six or seven months. It's been doing the job. You know, it's fairly thick, it's fairly sturdy and it holds water for roughly seven to 10 days between fill-ups, so it's not bad at all. But one thing I wanna share with you guys, this is something that's really important when it comes to, you know, auto top-offs in general. Get a piece of rigid airline tubing. This really changed the game when it comes to, you know, maximizing the use of your auto top-off. We've all been there. Flexible hose bends up in the bottom of your container and either doesn't use all of the water available or even worse, in my situation, if you're gonna to try to use calc, it sucks up that slurry or that calc paste that builds up on the bottom of your tank. So definitely, uh, if you can, get your hands on rigid airline tubing and get your hands on a you know a power strip with switches on it. Two huge things that will make your life easier in the hobby. So besides using the rigid airline tubing, the second thing I've learned to do, keep in mind this is my second time using calc on my tank. First time was roughly a year ago, but I still remember some of those lessons. And the main one being, be very careful with the output for your auto top off. You don't want this dumping into your main display on top of your corals or into some kind of low flow area. So, you know, you definitely want to have it mixing in properly before it gets to your main display. That's the reason I have it routed to the right of my sump. You know, it goes through all the weirs, goes through the reactor pumps, goes through the skimmer pumps before it gets the chance to get hit my return section and eventually make its way into the display. What I've found that, you know, with calc, the potential for pH spikes and all those things definitely are reality. And the more time you give it to mix in, the less chance for that, you know, to happen in your reef tank. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the reef. You know, overall, I can't complain too much. I still haven't had any major tank crashes or, you know, burned on my corals or killed on my livestock yet. <laughs> and I say yet because nothing's guaranteed. It almost got to the point to where, you know, things were getting boring, you know things were going so steady and so consistent that I didn't have to worry about anything but as we know in this hobby that never lasts forever so let's talk about the latest incident that I found in my reef tank and I'm talking about bubble algae now a few months ago I actually made a video covering how I removed this same brain coral you know removed the bubble algae that was attached to it and assumed my problems were behind me you know my bubble algae days were in the past well I was wrong as you can tell, it is coming back with a vengeance. And I'll say a vengeance more like 
a snail's pace because the amount of bubble algae in my tank is not extreme, but it has started to show up in a couple of different places that are starting to concern me. First one being on my blasto coral. On the coral itself doesn't bother me, but it's starting to spread to my rock work does. So at this point, gotta finally stop being lazy and watch this stuff slowly take over my tank, get in here and remove it. Now, it wasn't until I looked at my power head, you know, just turning it on, never paid attention to it. I found this huge, I would say colony or whatever you want to call it, a bubble algae growing quietly behind my power head. So definitely time to, uh, you know, get it to get this stuff out of my tank. So I'll cover that in a later video. But for now, bubble algae is in effect and I got to do something about it. So the next thing I want to share with you guys is regarding the SPS coils in my tank. I've had this green style of pore coral on my tank, I would say roughly eight months or so. Last couple of months, it has been growing crazy fast. And that's a good thing, at least you would think it's a good thing, except if you miscalculate it like I did. And I'm bringing this up for anyone that is new and setting up their tank, it's something you need to pay attention to, the space between the glass and your corals. You know, it wasn't until now that I finally hit the point to where I cannot squeeze my mag float past this coral anymore. As you can tell, a couple of pieces are dangling because I've literally accidentally fragged this thing multiple occasions just trying to clean the glass. So, you know, I'm definitely going to have to either use some kind of scotch pad or something to kind of clean around that area or get some kind of flipper or something that has a thinner, you know, frame on it to where it'll fit through there. But ultimately, this coral is growing to a fault and, you know, I'm going to still have to start fragging and just kind of keep my eye on making sure I don't break this thing too much. So I just want to throw that out there for FYI. Make sure you leave space between the glass and account for coral growth in your reef tank. Now, another quick word of advice, try to space out your corals if you can. Otherwise, you'll end up with coral warfare like you're seeing right now. You know, I got my purple Superman mushrooms in the middle, green octospine in the front, red monopore on the right, and then yellow button polyps in the back. All fighting for this same space. How is it going to work out? Who knows? You know, I'm thrilled to find out, but at the same time, I know I'm going to lose something. So definitely your FYI, make sure you're paying attention to your, you know, proximity of your corals. So if you guys have been following my channel, you know, I've been patiently waiting and, you know, searching for a piece of Satosa coral to put on this rock work. You know, I had a perfect space for it, in my opinion, for it to grow and encrust and, you know, give me that nice splash of red color on the right side of the tank. And as you can tell, finally got my hands on one. Now, I missed out on some better looking specimens. I'll admit that, but overall, I think it's a pretty, you know, decent piece. I believe it was $40 at the LFS, and I cut it off the plug and glued it to the rock work. Now, the hope is that these little white patches on the bottom are not from bleaching and more from being stung from the Hollywood Stunner Chalice, and I'll try to remedy that if that's the case, but overall, you know, I'm thrilled with the location and, you know, the potential this coral has in my tank, so I'll keep you guys posted for sure. Now, I did have one coral loss I wanna share with you guys. And it was my neon hammer coral. Now it's been slowly on the decline the last month and a half or so, but it wasn't until I, you know, I put it in between these two frog spines to where it really finally just took a turn for the worse. Can't tell if it was water quality or the coral itself dying, or if it has something to do with the frog spine, because you know your filiates are supposed to be able to touch each other without a problem. So ultimately, I end up losing this coral. I only have one head of it saved in the back, but I just want to throw that as an FYI, just in case anyone else is wondering. You know, are all corals safe together? You know, in theory, yes, but you never know until you try it. So let's take a second and talk a little about the anemones in my reef tank. You know, ultimately I don't give these guys a lot of camera time because, you know, they're pretty well behaved. I'm pretty happy I have an anemone that doesn't move or cause too much trouble in my reef tank, right? But there is a few things I wanna share with you guys I've noticed over the last few days. And this is the first thing. Take a look at the GSP. It was slowly growing and encrusting dangerously close to anemone. And I was wondering, you know, how that was going to play itself out. Was the GSP going to win or the anemone going to win? As you can tell, the anemone clearly is winning. And that's good for me because, you know, the less this GSP can take over my whole scape and threaten to spread all over my rock work, the better. And I'm pretty happy the anemone can keep it at bay. Now, will it last forever? Who knows? But I'm definitely uh, happy with the way it's working out. Now, if you guys remember, I started off with one anemone and it split into two. And these things have not moved for, I would say, three or four months. Definitely going to chalk that up to, you know, the right lighting, the right flow. And more importantly, a nice little crevice for them to attach their foots to. 
to keep them happy. So, you know, overall, thrilled with the anemones. I'm not feeding them. I don't want them to grow too big, but you know, the clownfish likes it. He has two houses and definitely uh, a good look for my reef tank. So, anemones here to stay in the reef tank for now. So that's pretty much going to cover all the corals I really wanted to highlight this video. You know, I got a lot of corals in the tank and, you know, talking about every single one would take a long time, especially if there's no real change or significance to really share with you guys. So, you know, this is one of those situations to where no news is good news. And as much as I can do that in this hobby, you know, the better. So as far as livestock changes, um, everything is still the same now. I say now because over the last couple of weeks, I did try to reintroduce some more chromas you know my goal was to have a group of about five or four or five chromas swimming around my tank you know schooling do what they do but it just wasn't in the cards guys you know within a few hours of adding them one was immediately caught by my core bandit shrimp he was eaten and then the other three have completely disappeared so i'm assuming they were chased by the six line wrasse which i've witnessed and then the one dominant you know chromas has been in the tank for the last few months killed the rest of them so you know mission was a failure to say the least but that's pretty much the highlight of my livestock you know nothing else has changed everything's still the same and you know unless i run across a new deal or find me a peppermint hogfish then i'm gonna keep it the same for you know until future notice so at the time of this update video i say it's been roughly nine days since my last water change and that's pretty damn significant especially if you guys follow me you already know why but this tank's been going through a slow but steady transition. You know, for the last four months, it's been all about three water changes a week, no dosing, you know, maintaining my parameters with just purely fresh salt water and just going from there. And, you know, I say it was pretty successful. I can't say it did not work, but ultimately my schedule change and life change just wouldn't allow me to continue it. So fast forward to today, I have moved on to using calc washer. Now, before we talk about calc, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what I've learned about my tank's consumption before using the calc. Now, it wasn't until I tried to figure out how much alkalinity my tank was consuming that I really finally understood the value of having a HANA checker. That alkalinity HANA checker, spinning out that digital readout, made my life so much easier than translating colors. When you're trying to find out how much alkalinity your tank's using, you know, from one day to the next, the change may be so small or so minute that a color change with a salad for kit or a API kit just wouldn't detect it. So that's ultimately what led me to checking my tank's parameters every two days, try to get a bigger change. And what I found out was pretty shocking and I didn't realize how much my tank consumed until I did this. I uh, started off one day, my alkalinity was around 9.6. Two days later, it had dropped all the way down to an 8.2. Now, for people who don't know about a reef tank, normally I might not see too much of a number. It might not seem too important, but that's almost a drop of 0.5 to 0.7 DKH per day. And that is an extremely high amount of alkalinity consumption for a reef tank. So, you know, ultimately I understand why I got a tank full of corals, but knowing that I was keeping up with my tank with water changes really takes on a whole new level of understanding now because I was really fighting a losing battle and eventually you know I wasn't going to be able to keep up anyways no matter how many water changes I did so definitely uh was a great you know food for thought and it was a good revelation for me and it let me know that I'm on the right track you know all roads eventually lead to Dosen, and this is kind of where we are today so I'm finally using calc on my reef tank. You know, a lot of you guys may be wondering, hey, you know, why aren't you using two part? I use this, you know, I use that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, guys, the main reason is because I had so much of it left over. I had three fourths of a bottle of calc left from my first time using it earlier last year. So I figured, hey, why not go back to one of the easiest methods of maintaining, you know, your alkalinity and calcium and use it in my auto top off. So ultimately guys, that's the plan. I'm gonna use this until I run out. And if it's, you know, working well by that time, 
then I'll continue using it. But if it's not and I need, you know, a different way of managing my parameters, I'll look into those ways later. But for now, sticking with calc on my auto top off, I started off with roughly two tablespoons per gallon. I'm not going to uh, supercharge it or, you know, try to increase that solution with vinegar or anything yet. Let's just see how this plays out. You know, I added this two days ago, so it's too early to tell just how much it's maintaining things. But I will give you guys my, you know, preliminary results that I've checked today. And it's pretty good so far. Now, when it comes to the alkalinity, I wanted it close to 10. And that's pretty much where it is. It's like 9.8 with my Hannah alkalinity checker. Calcium is setting at 440. Magnesium is at 1440. Now, keep in mind that magnesium is going to be managed by my water changes, which I've done almost nine days ago. And it's still that high. So no problems there. My only concern, and this is my main concern with calc, is if you get the solution wrong, you will have a huge pH spike. My pH, you know, historically has always been 7.8, 7.9, you know, in the lower range on my tank. Checked it before this video, it was at 8.2. Now that's with the API, you know, pH test kit. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but ultimately it is higher than what it used to read with that API kit. So am I overly concerned? Not really. You know, ultimately 8.2 is where you want to re retank anyways. But how fast you get there is ultimately where the problems come in. Now, if you guys take a look at my corals, everything's okay for the most part, but my Duncan coral is not extremely happy. My purple torch on the right is also not fully open. Now, that's mainly due to me moving it, but the Duncan coral definitely is my first indicator to when something isn't quite right. So I believe that pH spiking is part of the reason. Now, if it stays the same, things will readjust, things will you know acclimate and get back to normal but i am keeping an eye on it so ultimately guys that's the plan and that's kind of where i really want to leave this update you know finally using calc finally uh got my hands on the white stuff and i'm finally you know getting more of a idea of how much my tank uses and how much it will need to keep growing and thriving so i'll keep you guys updated for sure and we'll keep it moving so i think this is a good point to stop this update and when it comes to any future changes, you know, livestock coral changes, definitely gonna be adding some more cores, but gotta wait until I get everything settled out with this calc and my parameters and get everything stable like I like. So other than that, I think we're gonna get out of here, guys. So as always, hey, you guys definitely like, comment, subscribe. You guys do what y'all do. Y'all be easy and happy reefing.